Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at Venture Cafe for another virtual artist talk. Uh, my name is Angela McQuillan, and I'm the curator of the Esther Klein Gallery, which is part of the Science Center, which is also home to Venture Cafe. So today we're featuring a presentation by our current bio artist in residence, Laura Splann. Um, this residency program is a collaboration between the University City Science Center and the biotech company Integral Molecular, where artists spend time researching um, a creative project and collaborating directly with scientists in a laboratory setting. So this is actually Laura's second residency with us. Her first was in 2018 and culminated in her solo exhibition at Esther Klein Gallery in 2019 called Confirmations. Um, so today Laura's gonna talk about that project and also ways that it's developing and continuing in her second residency. So um, Laura's plan is a Brooklyn-based artist whose work intersects science, technology, design, and craft. Her conceptually based approach mines the materiality of biotechnology to reveal poetic subjectives, hidden, hidden systems, and invisible labor. So Splen's um, biomedical themed artworks have been commissioned by the Centers for Disease Control Foundation. Her work has been exhibited at the Museum of Arts and Design and the Beale Center for Art and Technology and is represented in the collections of the Toma Art Foundation. Reviews and articles including her work have appeared in the New York Times and Discover Magazine. Um, she's also received funding from the Jerome Foundation and her residencies have been supported by the Institute for Electronic Arts, Harvest Works, and the Pollock Krasner Foundation. Laura has been a visiting lecturer at Stanford University and is currently a Creative Experiments track member at NEW Inc., the new museum's cultural incubator in New York City. So now I'd like to please welcome our guest, Laura Splann. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Are you seeing my slide, Angela? Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me as part of this virtual Venture Cafe series. And um, thank you everyone for logging in. Um, I'm going to start this presentation with a few older projects to create some background on how I came to be not only a one-time artist in the Science Center's BioArt residency, but now a returning artist less than two years later, thanks in no small part to both Angela McQuillan and the Esther Klein Gallery um, and Ben Durans of Integral Molecular, um, who are both here. Uh, and I'll be ending my presentation with several animation experiments in progress that are a result of this residency that continues through July. And I'd also like to thank the Knight Foundation, who supported my 2018 residency, and the Dolfinger McMahon Foundation for supporting my return. Um, my work as a whole explores intersections of science, technology, and culture to destabilize and reframe our relationship with the everyday. And to even redefine what the everyday means. I often mine the materiality of biomedical and domestic landscapes to make poetic connections behind hidden structures and unseen labor. In 2004, I created a series of lace viruses in response to the first SARS outbreak and our increasing unease with the microbial world. This project was grounded in the intricacy of textiles and its association with familiarity and comfort, while also being driven by a deep fascination with the seductive and sometimes alien representations of the biological world. I often try to compel an intimate engagement with detail, calling into question how things are made and what they are made of. And I use processes and tools that challenge notions of what is made by hand, and what is made by machine, what is natural and what is fabricated, and what is science and what is culture. And I'm especially interested in the history of inventions of scientific apparatus and the cultural circumstances in which they are conceived. The history of Rene Lenach's invention of the stethoscope in 1816 is fraught with varying accounts of its conception that cite gender relations as much as technical research and auscultation. One version of its invention tells the story of a well-endowed female patient who by some accounts was too modest to have Lanik lay his head on her chest. By other accounts, it was he that was too modest. 
Lanik's solution to this socially awkward moment was to roll up a sheet of paper to create his first iteration of the stethoscope. The stethoscope itself embodies a social paradigm, a prescribed comfortable distance between doctor and patient, male and female. In my stethoscope sculpture created in 2002, I extended the length of the instrument to 25 feet, the longest distance at which one can still hear a part beating at the other end. Its absurdity belies its continued, albeit diminished, function and questions notions of technical standards on which an institutional device is based. My embodied object series used electromyography sensors to create data-driven artworks. Neuromuscular activities associated with experiences of wonder were performed as facial expressions and bodily movements such as smiling in delight, blinking in disbelief, and frowning in confusion. Each activity produced unique data captured by an EMG sensor that was translated into a curve using custom software, which I then used to create data-driven patterns and forms for 3D printed sculptures and computerized jacquard weavings. This fringe effect on the perimeter of the weavings was created by unraveling individual threads by hand along the machine woven edges. And this act of unraveling was particularly evocative and murky territory. What does it mean to unravel the work of a machine? Is the work of a machine less valuable or precious than that of the hand? So with this process, as with other studio projects that engage my fingers beyond the operation of a mouse, I would often find myself thinking the word undo in my head when making a mistake. And this absurd confusion of corporeal and technological experience was striking to me. And so with this tapestry titled Undo, I recorded muscle movement as I was unraveling another weaving. And I often seek out these recursive and hybrid combinations of materials and processes with technology to challenge values of the hand in creative production and question notions of agency and chance in aesthetics. And this project is the most recent example of part of a much larger investigation of the body as material, as interface, and as data. In 2018, I was invited to be one of the first bio artists in residence at the Science Center in Philadelphia, where I was hosted by biotech company Integral Molecular. And during my three month residency, I had the opportunity to shadow scientists and attend lab meetings where I took many copious and cryptic notes and also had the unique access to move around the lab taking many photographs and videos of often unseen vignettes of biotechnology. And I was particularly drawn to the lab machines with their quirky interfaces and their often absurd language that seems now more than ever so oblivious to the outside world we're living in. And the images served as a document of the numerous biotechnological artifacts I observed in the lab. Um, but I also had the opportunity to experiment with some of the software that scientists were using for their antibody research. And this software called PyMol works with molecular models that are publicly available on the protein databank. And so, of course, the first thing I found myself doing was unraveling protein structures, such as this model of a ricin toxin bound to a camelid nanobody or structure 4Z9K in the protein databank. And the camelid referred to was specifically an alpaca. Uh, alpacas and llamas have unique antibody structures called nanobodies that are easier to work with in laboratory research. And by using the quote unquote sculpting feature in the software in unconventional ways, I created animations that are collaborative doodles of sorts between the software my hand and the molecular stru structures that are being disrupted. And as the protein structures are manipulated, the software renders uncanny disturbances in the form of sometimes spastic and sometimes sublime movements. 
And these videos are unedited screen recordings of performed interactions where my mouse is hidden. So the labor of artists and software is collapsed by the seemingly autonomous moving form. And during this residency, I was struck by this use of animals for the production of antibodies for human drugs, including vaccines and antiviral treatments. And in response to my curiosity, the lab's president, Ben Durans, miraculously procured over 200 pounds of llama and alpaca fiber from other laboratories. And I began working with this wool by hand washing, carding, and spinning the fiber into yarn to be used in sculptures and installations. In an exhibition at the Esther Klein Gallery in Philadelphia last year, I situated sculptures made with this hand spun yarn among other artworks that referenced invisible artifacts of biotechnology, including photographs, sculptures, and animations made with the molecular modeling software. And the work in the exhibition attempted to question notions of the presence and absence of bodies, evoking the mutability of categories that delineate their status. And Lumen choreographs viewers' movements to sit on a rug made with the wool of these laboratory animals. In biology, the lumen is the interior part of a cell where a protein is folded and modified. Sitting on the rug engages viewers with unseen materialities and labor of biotechnology as they touch the yarn and listen to the accompanying sound, uh, soundtrack that's entitled Chaperone. The soundscape layers recordings made in the laboratory during my 2018 residency and another component of this project and research is an interrogation of the language that's used to explain science. Um, this is another piece from the Esther Klein exhibition that includes appropriated text from the book Molecular and Cell Biology for Dummies that equates plasma membranes with international boundaries and cast proteins as customs officers. And the text reads, the plasma membrane is the barrier between the cell and its environment. You can think of the plasma membrane as an international boundary, like the border between two countries. The molecules that act like customs officers are proteins. Receptors, receptor proteins receive signals on the outside of the cell and relay the message to the inside of the cell. This language is often fraught with antagonistic metaphors that are grounded in narratives of trickery. So here we have, after the virus is attached, it may force itself into the cell by digging a hole through a cell wall, slip in by fusing its envelope with the membrane of the host cell or trick the cell into bringing it inside. And also competition. Here we have bigger molecules will be closer to the starting line and smaller molecules will be closer to the finish line. And also surveillance, signals arrive at the membrane with messages for the cell. Molecules seek to cross in and out and defensive proteins from the immune system wander by to make sure that everything is okay inside the cell. And finally, assimilation. Chaperone proteins assist folding of new proteins and guide proteins to their proper locations within the cell. And I've continued to collect even more metaphors and language that's emerging out of the communication of science around the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I have quite a list going at the moment. Um, and while I was processing the llama wool in my studio, I would often find clumps of feces, which I began to collect for this networked laboratory mixer that is agitated by Twitter. The device activates when Twitter hashtags associated with the culturally contested status of science are tweeted. Here, the mere mention of global warming or vaccination agitates tubes filled with laboratory animal feces. Since taking office, the Trump administration has advised how to improve the chances of receiving research funding with the suggestion to avoid words and phrases like vulnerable, diversity, entitlement, transgender, fetus, 
evidence-based, and science-based. And the administration has also refused to sign statements that mention climate change. As visitors exited this exhibition, faint text on a wall invited viewers to come close to read, our distance allows our intimacy. And the phrase refers to the complexities of existence in the biotechnological age where understanding of our own bodies and the bodies of others is increasingly mediated by technology. The sculpture blows a breeze in the viewer's face as they, as they read the text. The speed of the networked van intermittently adjusts to the wind conditions near a farm in Western Pennsylvania. This farm is actually the 600 acre biological laboratory that gave me the wool from their 2018 shearing of their llamas. And earlier this year, they invited me for a three hour tour of their sprawling facilities to meet and photograph the llamas. And at the beginning of this year, I um, was able to do a bioart residency at Coalesce at the University of Buffalo. And I wanted to see what would happen if I brought the llama yarn back into the laboratory. What could be explored around notions of hybridity, transgression of boundaries, engineered bodies, and invisible labor. So I came to coalesce with the goal of genetically manipulating bacteria to produce pigment to be used to dye this yarn. And to do this, I used a lab technique called bacterial transformation in which a cell is genetically manipulated to incorporate DNA from its surroundings through its cell membrane. And this commonly used lab technique is used to introduce a foreign plasmid or DNA into bacteria. And the bacteria then amplifies the plasmid, making large quantities of it. And a plasmid is a small circular piece of DNA that contains genetic information for the growth of the bacteria. And I was working with a few different plasmids that might be used to dye the yarn in combination with E. coli bacteria, which is often referred to as a workhorse of the laboratory. And for transformation to take place, the bacteria must be in a state of what's called competence or having small holes in the bacterial cells for a DNA plasmid to pass through. And I was particularly interested in the narrative implications of this transgression of boundaries as it was being choreographed in this decidedly Baroque approach to artificially producing pigments that already occur naturally in other bacteria. And the residency supported me in the development of several protocols I needed to transform the bacteria um, so that they could produce different pigment and color for dyeing the yarn, including fluorescence seen here, purple, blue, and also green. And my research also included comparing undyed and dyed fibers of yarn, um, but soon after my return home from the residency, New York City went on lockdown for the COVID-19 pandemic. So these bacterial dye experiments are now in suspension as I'm waiting to return to a lab to continue production on what will ultimately be developed into textile sculptures and installations for upcoming exhibitions. So while sheltering in place and unable to travel to my studio, I returned to my molecular modeling experiments on my computer. And I also reached out to Ben and rather absurdly asked if he needed a remote Pi Mall artist in residence for the creation of some new molecular modeling animations that had been brewing in my head since my exhibition at the Esther Klein Gallery. And he very unexpectedly agreed that he did need a Pi Mall artist in residence, which I began in April. So these new animations are being created in remote collaboration with Integral Molecular based on their research on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And the, the residency includes Zoom meetings with scientists, including Ben and also Edgar Davidson, who's also in the room. Um, to discuss their research on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, as well as discussions about which models would be appropriate for these animations that may include such structures as spike proteins, nanobodies, and human cell receptors. 
And our meetings have wandered into discussions of subjectivity and molecular vi visualizations, as well as the scientific and creative implications of the software's features. And as I've shared these animation tests with the scientists, new conversations are emerging around such topics as the aesthetics of the software and the role of the spike protein structural changes in infectivity. And these, an these animations are part of a continued exploration of interconnected systems as they are affected by both human and natural forces at macro and micro scales. And by leveraging the specialized commands and unique features of the PyMol software, I'm interested in evoking the precarity of underlying structures that have been rendered so visible during the coronavirus pandemic. And I've been spending the last three months um, in quarantine, sheltering in place, um, studying new features and tools in PyMol, and including the ability to automatically animate or morph two different conformations of a single protein structure. So with the earlier animations, I was using the sculpting feature to unravel proteins but the animations were, were all rather part of a quirkier part of the software. And with these new animations, I'm using this morphing feature to create these automated um, animations. And I'm also using the morphing feature to animate SARS-CoV-2 structures that I have unraveled by hand. And this is a, a slower animation of an unraveled protein structure being um, put back into its conformation. And so I've been experimenting with um, controlling the speed and um, it's, it's very strange software that uh, is often very difficult to control, but um, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, and I'm also able to export the PyMol animations to be used in more conventional video software for further processing, such as duplication and rotation, um, and, and have further control over scale and speed. And um, it's kind of quickly gone the direction of these mesmerizing um, radially symmetrical forms. And during my meetings with Edgar Davidson, we also discussed the conformation or structural changes that the spike protein undergoes that affect its infectivity and allow the virus to enter the cell. And so I've been experimenting with the morphed animation of the spike protein conformations in particular, and also um, playing with different representations of the protein structures, um, playing with the color, um, and also been obsessing over not only the palette of colors available in PyMol, but also the names of the colors as well. And more recently, I've been doing away entirely with the color to create more haunting and meditative animations. And then very selectively adding color back in, in subtle ways to create more dimension. And as I continue to work on the animations through the summer, I'm, I'm thrilled that they will actually have an immediate home as I've been invited to be in residence at BioBat Art Space in Brooklyn while the gallery's programming is suspended due to COVID. And this residency will give me the unique opportunity to experiment with large scale projection of these animations in their unique 15,000 square foot dark space. And I'll be creating more animations over the next couple of months and posting them on my social media and my website. So you can follow my residency experiments and studio updates on Instagram or other social media. And I'm happy to take questions about um, these recent experiments or their earlier work as well. And um, this work will also be exhibited and included in an exhibition um, along with other work in 2021 in February 
at the New Gallery at Austin P State University in Clarksville, Tennessee. So I'm gonna. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, I'm just gonna um, exit out of the. I really love your new work and it's amazing how much these animations look like thread or wool fibers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you expect that to happen? I mean, it's kind of crazy how um, um, it ties together in your work. Yeah, I think I stopped screen sharing. Did I stop? You did. Okay, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, that was the first thing I was drawn to in that software was this um, kind of thread-like quality of the proteins and um, and that was sort of the space with which I experimented in the software initially and um, yeah so it's kind of taken on some other layers with the ability to duplicate and uh, animate in different ways other than just the um, kind of unraveled part of it but also playing with speed and and color and eventually in the biobat space um, with scale as well and, and um, proximity so thinking about how to create an immersive experience where there there could possibly be multiple uh, projections yeah so biobat is this huge space you said it was like fifteen thousand square feet or yeah something. yeah so elena is actually here she's one of the founders and curators of biobat um, Elena, I'm happy for you to chime in, chime in if you'd like to, but um, yeah, it's this um, wonderful, relatively new bio art space in the Brooklyn Army Terminal in um, Brooklyn, and um, it's got a kind of clean, white, beautiful gallery space in the front, and then a ginormous um, back space that's a dark space. So, Elena, did you want to say anything about that? Sure. Yeah, well, the dark space was originally um, storage that wasn't really being used. And um, Eva Kramer and Kathleen Oto, who run Biobat, were kind enough to let us convert it into an exhibition space. And so we thought it would be great for showing new media and projections and tech and bioluminescence. So that, that was kind of how we came upon the, the dark space. Yeah. Yeah, and we're excited to have you. Yeah, it's going to be great. Can um, we it? Does anyone have any questions for Laura? Well, well Laura, I'll just say I, I was really struck by your videos, you know, the uh, of, of the coronavirus. It, it, it was, you know, as, as scientists, we, we, we sometimes make videos of the virus moving um, because those proteins are very dynamic proteins. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, for, I forget if we, if you've seen any of those videos or not. Um, but it really takes from biology, it takes from real life and, and kind of expands it into, you know, what's, what's going on with the, with the virus. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I think you and definitely Edgar both pointed me to some websites and Twitter accounts that are posting um, these animations. Um, and, and they're, yeah, they have a lot of strange, quirky personality and, and sometimes in and of themselves are kind of haunting. So I was kind of running with that with some of the directions I was going. But the, the software itself, like it, it has a lot of really unique features that I'm still exploring. Um, one is that it has this infinite space. So you can animate on an X, Y, Z axis presumably to infinity. So it, it has um, a lot of kind of open world, you know, kind of video game, like open world qualities that I'm interested in exploring beyond just this kind of um, screen based, like screen oriented um, kind of layout of, of the animated forms. Um, the, one of the other features that this software has is that it, um, it's Python based, so you can actually code Python in the, in the console. It has a command line feature and I've started experimenting with that and I've made a little bit of progress, but I don't have anything that I feel like showing yet on that front. So it's still very rough and, but it's a really intriguing part 
of that software for me to start introducing data as a way to affect the animation and the movement of the protein structures. Um, so we have a question from Ruth. What kinds of processes will you use to dye the wool with bacteria colors? Um, so when I was experimenting at the residency in Buffalo, we were basically culturing the transformed E. coli um, in large beakers in the incubator and just trying to grow as much transformed bacteria as possible and even put suspending the yarn in the beaker in the incubator. Um, the green was actually very successful. Um, and yeah, so, so that was kind of as far as I got with, with that particular workflow. And um, I'm, I'm eager to return to it and kind of experiment with some larger quantities and some other ways of um, using, using the, the culture. So the other thing that I actually tried was, um, was pelleting out the culture to collect, um, to collect the pigment at the bottom of a test tube. Um, so centrifuging the culture and then having like a more um, concentrated form of it. But it was, you know, it was all very small quantities. It has a long way to go in terms of dyeing any quantity of yarn. But again, like my interest in the whole project and the whole like concept and, and um, protocol of it was very conceptually driven and I was as interested in like getting one little piece of kind of cream colored yarn dyed a beautiful green as I was in all of the kind of absurd um, steps that had to go into getting that one piece of yarn dyed green and um, so for that project you know I will it, it won't end up just being textiles. It's also very much in, going to include apparatus. Like I, I'm really interested in bringing the apparatus and, um, and actually making sculptures that are versions of those apparatus that can exist in a gallery. Um, so um, yeah, there was, there were a lot of experiments that we ran to, but the, just suspending the yarn in the beaker itself was the most successful. So I'm just wondering, sometimes you do craft work by hand, such as like spinning wool or you've done latch hook in the past. And then other times you use technology to do this process for you, like in your doilies or weavings. So how do these processes feel different to you when you're creating and do you have a preferred method? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that experience of saying undo in my head when I'm latch hooking <laughs> kind of answers that question. <laughs> it's like they all, it all feels the same to me. And that, that's to say that um, the, the craft with textiles, like the, the latch hook, um, even like hand weaving or hand knitting, uh, hand embroidering, all of that is more in the realm of what I grew up with, what I grew up around. But I have worked very intensively on computers and in many different software um, packages for years. Um, and that's where I feel most comfortable. Um, I actually feel very, clumsy, I would say, when I'm working with my hands and textiles. Mm -hmm. um, and everything just feels very precarious. Like, I, I, I love this, I don't know, there's a, a safety of the computer interface, um, the digital realm that you can undo. And when you can't undo in real life, it feels very precarious. <laughs> um, so that, that sensation is real. <laughs> Um, but also at the same time, I, I 
strongly feel that what I'm creating in either PyMall or computerized embroidering software is very related to craft. There, there's a lot of similar decision making going on that is, and, and also similar skill. I mean, there's a skill to controlling Bezier curves in vector graphics. There's a skill to um, sculpting in PyMall. There's a skill to, um, to understanding the paradigm that most software is based on, whether it's like layers or um, different mouse gestures, um, that translates in the same way that there's skill and kind of materials uh, foundations and similarities among different textiles processes. So I, I see them as much less separate than I think most people do. And I really enjoy the way that using both can create confusion and kind of be that wrench in the gear that sometimes makes people reconsider an object or an image. Yeah, I love that. Um, we have a question from Marjorie. How fluid is your creative process? Do you unravel in your downtime when you aren't in the lab? And what have you done, techniques, disciplines, et cetera, to make your process fluid? Hmm. Um, I think that fluid is an interesting term. I wouldn't describe my process or my practice that way. I, I would describe production that way, but that production is just one part of my process. Um, I spend a lot of time making lists and spreadsheets and mind maps. <laughs> um, and that's part of my process. That's not, I wouldn't call it as fluid as some of the production where there is a fluidity to um, creative production that you're, you know, you're making a mistake and responding to it, or you're, you're making a mistake and discovering something new, discovering a new direction that, is is like a lot of kind of riffing and fluidity there um so and i'm sort of fine with it not always being fluid i don't i don't actually try to introduce fluidity into my work um elena wants to know are you thinking of making a bioluminescent dye for the yarn and how long does the luminescence last um I have thought about that and I haven't found a way to make it last. <laughs> so the, the, the yarn that I did dye with the luminescent bacteria, um, it, it would luminesce a little bit and then it just kind of faded. So that's something that I could, kind of bang my head against the wall more to pursue um, and do more research. But I actually was really drawn to the purple and the green and the blue. So um, I'm kind of more interested in, I guess like with the fluorescence, not introducing one more technological layer that there's that to, to, to actually have the, the, um, purple or green be this something that's seemingly familiar and then not until you understand what made it purple or green that it becomes suddenly alien. Whereas with the fluorescence, it sort of has this immediately alien quality that um, I kind of wanted to hold off on people experiencing. So I wasn't actually that um, tied to the fluorescence. It was actually just the easiest to transform. Um, it was, it was the simplest protocol. That was why I actually included it. Um, whereas the blue and the purple and green were a little bit more complicated. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for Laura? Well, I'll, I'll ask Laura, you know, I know you've given a lot of thought towards color schemes in your, in, in the work. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've also given a lot of thought to 
what coronavirus is doing to communities of color. I don't know if those are related, but I know you're giving a lot of thought to each of them. Yeah, so the color, you know, I, I've been looking at these names of colors in Paimal and kind of, kind of getting more drawn into um, these names that relate to nature. Um, so there's a lot of names for like fruit or forest, you know, there's a lot of um, colors that are, that Paimal has named. I mean, they're not, they're not, um, they're not, it's not a color palette that comes from somewhere else. It's, um, it's just an arbitrary set of colors within the software that do in fact have names. And um, so I was kind of, in terms of color, I was more interested in thinking about um, what is engineered and what is natural. Um, so that's what's driving me on color right now. And the, the color that I'm, I've kind of landed on for the moment is this limon or limon color that's like this pale fluorescent green. Um, and of course, the, the lemon being a hybrid in and of itself. So um, I'm kind of more interested in, in that aspect of color in Pimal. But, the, um, but to your point, uh, that's, where, that's where I land with the data. So there's so much, um, you know, sociopolitical and, you know, turmoil in this medical global crisis um, that is colliding and intersecting and collapsing in very strange ways. And so I've, I've been looking at data relating to um, racial disparity in how the coronavirus has affected different uh, populations. And that's the kind of data that I want to start to bring in um, to within the Python programming um, module in, uh, in, in PyMall to start affecting the, um, the animation so that there could actually be, that the movement itself could be a data visualization of sorts. And in, with, you know, multiple animations being compared, that it would be another way to see those disparities. All right. Well, I think we're about out of time. Thank you so much, Laura. This has yeah. been really beautiful and interesting, and I can't wait to see how this project develops. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see your show at BioBat. Um, yeah, thanks so for put, having me. Of course. I put Laura's website in the chat if you want to follow her progress. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.